Welcome to this TechAbility Special Effect Accessible Gaming Webinar. Please press subscribe underneath the video if you want more of this content. And if it was useful, please hit like and leave us any feedback in the comments. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on special effects with uh, some accessible gaming. So we're joined here with uh, Jacob Holden today, who's occupational therapist for a special effect. Um, and he's just going to be talking through uh, what they do, um, what kind of things you can do. Um, you don't need to be a gamer to access today, even though we've been talking a little bit about gaming. Um, and we can take questions throughout. Uh, we are recording today and we'll send the recording out and it'll be uploaded to YouTube. Um, so without further ado, over to you, Jacob. Thank you. Cheers, Neil. So yeah, I'll um, just make sure I get my PowerPoint on view. Great. Uh, just to say you can join us on Twitter at tech underscore ability one. So if there's anything you'd like today, then feel free to post up there. If there's anything you'd want us to do in future, then let us know. Um, I'm just planning the September to, to December uh, webinars. So uh, that that's, uh, it's a good time to let me know if you've got any requests. Okay. Can you all see this? Yeah. That's Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So. Hello everybody, my name is Jacob and I am, as Neil said, an occupational therapist working at Special Effect, which is known as the Gamers Charity in the UK. So I'm just going to be going through a few things today in this presentation. So we're just going to be discussing about how Special Effect was founded, um, explain how Special Effect can help players with disabilities, uh, discussing key equipment, that we often use in our line of work. I'll also explain some gaming setups for individuals that we've worked with before, so like case studies, if you will. And also so it shows some uh, other resources that individuals may find useful, including our game access website. So Special Effect is a charity that helps people to find a way to use computer and gaming technology if they can't use, for example, like a standard game controller or a mouse and keyboard, we help provide them access to video games via specialized equipment. So it was launched by this chap with the arrow pointing down, that's Nick Donegan. So he started the charity special effect all the way back in 2007. So now we've got a team of uh, about, actually we're probably close to 30 people now. This is a fairly old photo because um, I'm not in it. And the team comprises of uh, other occupational therapists like myself, um, R&D people, so research and development, technicians, fundraising and communications, and also plenty of admin support. And as we are a charity, we have to raise all of the funds ourselves. So it's completely ran on 100% donations. So the fundraising team do a, an impeccable job in making sure to keep the, the charity afloat. So special effects Mick Donegan felt was needed because his background was working in a specialist school in Birmingham. And so he would often help these young people who would have um, disabilities. And after, you know, school day, um, the parents would come up to him and say, you know, um, it's great that my child can now access, you know, technology for, for learning, but what about for, for leisure? What about after school when everyone's off, you know, playing football or whatever? And Mick couldn't give him an answer. So um, that's why he felt that special effect was, was really needed in, um, in providing um, this charity. So um, he's also very involved with using the initial eye gaze technology, which is being able to control uh, a mouse cursor or a computer or tablet using just your eyes. So our role is to help people to play technology for games uh, and for leisure as well. So um, that's our main purpose. And that's where I'm part of the Loan Library project. So that's where we focus on the gaming side of things. And Year upon year, we've seen a lot of people use our services more, um, particularly during the, the pandemic, because um, people have been confined to their homes during lockdown, and gaming has been really crucial for a lot of the people that um, you know wouldn't be able to leave their homes at all. 
So as I mentioned before, it's just people who can't access the standard gamepad or can't at least access, you know, the entirety of a game controller. And we work with a whole range of physical conditions. So ranging from cerebral palsy, where people may have involuntary um, large movements where they can't access, you know, just really small buttons on a controller. Uh, we work with brain injuries, stroke, um, spinal cord injuries, so uh, muscular dystrophy, so people who have very limited strength and can't, you know, don't have enough um, muscle strength to physically move the joysticks or press the buttons. So we do our best to help them out to access um, gaming controls as best as possible. So we've got a website, we've got a form that anyone can fill in and anyone who has a physical disability will um, meet our criteria and be able to use our services and we work with every age possible. So we've worked with people as young as two um, all the way up to, you know, 80 plus, I believe. So it used to be that we would see people at home Back in, the, back in the days of pre-COVID. So um, we would often go to someone's house or they would come down to our games room. Uh, so we're based in Oxfordshire. And we will just do a bit of trial and error to make sure um, the person's got a really good setup to help them play games. So um, ever since then, uh, ever since pandemic, we've been doing video calls instead. So Zoom has really been our best friend in, um, in supporting people. So we have a video call with someone. We gather some information about the person's functional movements, their condition, the games that they want to play, the console they want to play it on. And then we tailor a setup, an equipment setup based on, on all those factors. <clears throat> so we end up kind of posting out equipment after we've had an initial discussion with someone through a video call and then we help them set up afterwards and provide them as you know as, as much support as needed and it's a lifelong service we offer so it's not a, a one-off call with anybody we work with them for as long as we need to so people who may have for example a progressive condition or they want to play more complicated games that require more joysticks more buttons then we continue to work with them until, you know, they've got a, a full setup. So the process is that someone gets in touch and then they, that inquiry gets passed on to one of the occupational therapists on the team. So it could be towards me. And then we'll get, get some more information about the person. We'll do that initial video or the, or the video call in this rate. And then we'll try and figure out some ideas on how we can help them to access the games and then we go through the initial loaning of the equipment so we can loan out um, anything as part of a, a long-term loan so any equipment that's used to play games so controllers switches or joysticks then we can loan out that equipment for as long as that person is using it and they can essentially we call it a long-term loan but if they want to purchase their own equipment then they can very much do so but we want to we want to make sure that the setup that they have is 100% right for them before they commit to purchasing because a lot of this equipment can be very expensive. And then get in touch if they, if they need us again. And there's no cost to our services either for, for, for any of it. It's completely free of charge. So just going to have a little chat about some of the equipment that we use in our line of work. So this is probably one of the biggest pieces of kit that we use very frequently. This is the Xbox adaptive controller. So what this is, it's a product released by Microsoft that has had input from various organizations into the design of the product, including from special effects. And what this is, it's an official Xbox controller that can connect natively to an Xbox One console and also an Xbox Series S or an Xbox Series X console and also PC. And it allows you to plug in external joysticks and switches into the controller. So that allows us to create a really custom setup so we can position the switches, we can position the joysticks wherever the person has movement. So it's been a real game changer in terms of how quickly we can connect something to a console and then get the equipment working instantly. It is a plug and play thing. And there's also one for the Nintendo Switch that's came out in the last uh, about a year or so now perhaps 
So this one is made by a company called Hori. So they are a third party um, controller company, but it has been you know, licensed for Nintendo, to be used for Nintendo Switch. So it's essentially the same kind of thing as the Xbox adaptive controller, but it just works natively with the Nintendo Switch. But having said that, we can get, for example, an Xbox adaptive controller working on uh, non-Xbox consoles, which I'll mention um, later on. So these are some of the joysticks that we often work with. So um, you can see in, in the top left, you've got what we call an ultra stick. So it's quite a large chunky joystick that comes with different toppers as well. So you can have that ball topper or you can have a sort of like a knobbly one or what we call like a T-bar. And that's really good for people who have <clears throat> say quite large uncontrolled movements. So it really lets them to, to get a grip on something that's, that sort of, you know, accommodates that person's movement. So conditions like in a cerebral palsy, it's a bit like those old school arcade machine style joysticks that you used to have. And then to the right of it, you have one called a zigzag. So it's very similar to the ultra stick, except you can see that the housing it's in, so that the silver part is actually a lot thinner compared to um, the ultra stick. Um, and the one underneath that is a Praetorian joystick. So again, that's um, quite a similar one that just works natively. These all work with the Xbox adaptive controller as well. There's also a range of uh, smaller joysticks that we use as well, like the one on the, the bottom left. So um, someone who may have quite a small amount of movements um, and need to be positioned elsewhere, then that can be very suitable for them. But also joysticks that can come out of the controller of a, so a controller on top right is an evil controller, which is meant to be for single-handed um, play. So you can kind of see there's um, a little switch on the underside of the left handle. So they actually act as um, the, the buttons, the, the, right the right trigger and the right bumper are basically um, attached to the bottom of the left handle there. So someone who can only access one side of their body can can access pretty much the entire controller and be able to use that joystick as well. And there is also um, a right side version as well, in case you're wondering. We often work with a lot of switches. So we work with um, large switches um, and also very small ones. So um, they also come in a range of different strength requirements. So the one the, the top left is called an ultralight switch that requires a very small amount of force to activate. So it's really good for people who have very small amount of movement, like in spinal muscular atrophy or um, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And you've got a lot of larger ones that really accommodate well with, for example, um, like an ultra stick. So you have like a large joystick and large buttons. So large targets work really well for a lot of people that we, that we work with. But also you've got in the bottom left, you've got the Logitech Adaptive Kit. So this is um, an official switch kit that has been released by Logitech that comes with a, a variety of switches of different sizes and different um, forces to activate them. And it comes with a couple of Velcro trays as well to position everything on. And again, all these work with the Horiflex and the Xbox Adaptive Controller. And these are really good for positioning wherever we need to for the person who who has movement to um to help them access the buttons and these are just a few of our mounting options so um we find that sometimes it's just you can we stick a, a switch or a joystick on a flat velcro tray often we um we find that if that's not enough we find a way to position if someone um can, for example, use their chin. Sometimes we position joysticks by someone's chin to help them uh, access the, the joystick if they feel they haven't got too much movement or no movement at all, sort of, you know, in their arms at all. So um, we often find people who say have, say, uh, spinal conditions who only have movement in their head and the neck. Uh, what you can see um, on the right that um, one of our OTs there actually is Liz. So she's, uh, showing how to use the uh, the Manfrotto variable friction arm, which is normally used for photography, but we use it to mount joysticks um, and switches wherever we need to. So it's really good in giving us a really flexible way of positioning stuff wherever wherever we need to. So um, yeah, chin joysticks are 
a really unique way of, of playing and the Manfratto arm is really good at doing that. Other ways of mounting include these um, these wedges, these are called Maxis wedges. And so we often find that people who may struggle to kind of hold a controller, we find resting it at a certain angle and removing the ability to, to hold a controller at all can help a lot of people out. So all they'd have to do is focus on pressing the buttons and moving the joysticks rather than holding it. And so these wedges, if you kind of, you can rest the controllers um, on the wedges and it just makes it a lot easier for um, a lot of people, with, a lot of the people that we work with. And you can see in the uh, bottom left, you can see the switches and the joystick are on like a lap train. So that's called a Trapezac Curve Connect. So it's just a lap tray with a Velcro um, surface essentially. So um, it, it's really good for you to want to sit on a sofa, put on a Trapezac and you can put on all your switches and your controllers on it. So it's a really, you know, mobile way of keeping everything compact. And if you want to just sort of, you know, hop on and off of the sofa whenever you're gaming. So we work with a lot of these uh, controllers as well. So um, what we say, we mean low force controllers. And so we've got, um, we, we've got a technician who um, has got his own company called OneSwitch. And he's the one who actually makes a lot of these joysticks like, um, like the Ultra Stick um, and the zigzag joystick that I mentioned before. What he often does is he can make the, these controllers low force, meaning they can be really sensitive. So you can actually remove the, the springs and the, um, the rumble packs of the controllers to make them physically lighter, but also be able to physically press in the buttons and physically move the joysticks a lot lighter as well. And that can work with a whole range of controllers like the ones you see here. And we find that some smaller controllers can work really well for people who, um, you know, who may not have a lot of movement. They might find, for example, an Xbox controller might be too large and chunky to kind of navigate around each button. So something smaller, like the one, the, the middle button, the Super Mario one could be um, more suitable, but there are a range of smaller controllers out there. Um, but also you can see you've got the Xbox Elite controller, which is the one with the silver paddles on the right there. So um, they can act as any button that you set them to, which is really good for people who, um, you know, who, who want to access, who can have movements um, on the inside of the handles because um, they act as buttons. So it's really good for kind of creating um, a custom layout for, for people who may not be able to press the, um, what we call the shoulder buttons. So that's kind of the, the, the top buttons and trigger buttons. So this is what I was talking about when I said we can get any controller working on um, any console. So this is the Titan II adapter. So this allows us to use, for example, the Xbox adaptive controller to be used on a, a PlayStation or on a Nintendo Switch. And we also use it a lot for, for voice controls on consoles. So we can actually hook up this Titan 2 to a laptop and we can actually make it so that you can use voice controls with a, with a console game by using a specialized voice script that, that we can help create. So if you see, and we can customize it to be any command you want. So you can set like the X button to be um, jump. So if you, if you would say jump, then it would do it um, on command on the game you're playing. So we've mentioned about the Xbox adaptive controller. So we often use this in conjunction with a feature on the Xbox One called Copilot. So what this means is Say you've got two controllers. So you've got an Xbox adaptive controller, but you've also got a standard Xbox controller. The Xbox console, so the Xbox One and the Xbox Series S and the Series X consoles, they've got a feature called Copilot, which allows you to connect two controllers up to act as player one. So you can basically share the controls with um, with either you know yourself or with another person. So someone could be having a few switches. Um, with the adaptive controller and someone else could be using the standard Xbox controller to play alongside them. And we often use it um, for people who may be able to access, for example, half of a standard Xbox controller, but then they need like extra switches or extra joysticks. And so that's where the Copilot feature really shines because it allows you to then just use a standard Xbox controller and use, um, you know, 
a few switches and an extra joystick with using the adaptive controller. And this kind of feature is also replicated using the Titan 2 adapter because it's got two USB ports in the adapter. It allows you to plug in two controllers into it. So that basically means it's the same same concept, really. It's, it's still doing co-pilot, so someone can use one controller, someone else could use um, another. And it's really good for, um, particularly for games that require a lot more buttons for, um, for someone who can maybe access a single switch and then someone else can access the rest of control. So it's a really good way to play um, cooperatively and really good for inclusion. So as I mentioned before, um, we work with someone and they may want to play a more complicated game. So we keep continuing to work with them and then we can add on more switches and more joysticks or more software to, to ensure that the person can play whatever game that they want to play next. So it's almost like a bit of a um, progressive thing in terms of just gradually building on a set a setup because um, to some people, we may not want to overwhelm them with several switches and joysticks in one go. We like to start off with a simple game that doesn't require too much movement or too much buttons and joysticks to play. So something like a racing game that typically requires two buttons and a joystick is a really good starting point. And then we can start working on that setup and building upon it as the person becomes more competent with it. But it's not just hardware that we work with. So we've mentioned about voice commands to be used, um, but a lot of the software and settings that we often find are within the, the consoles themselves. So PlayStation, Xbox, and Nintendo Switch all have the, um, a feature where you can remap your controller, which basically means so you can change the layout of the, a typical controller function to however you want to. So you can swap over buttons, you can swap over buttons over, you can swap joysticks over to create your own custom layout. So, for example, someone who may not be able to reach um, the L2 button, PlayStation, you can remap that button to be something else on the controller. So that can be, for example, like the triangle button. So it's really good that every single console now has the ability to, to do that. And we've also seen it a lot more in individual games as well to create your own layouts. So I'm just going to go through a couple of case studies. So these are people that we've worked with. So this is Ethan, and he has cerebral palsy. This is also before um, the pandemic. So we actually saw that back in, I think it was like very early 2020 before everything kicked off. So he's nonverbal, but he wanted to play the Lego games and Spyro the Dragon on the PlayStation 4. And what we did is because we know Spyro is a it's a very accessible game in terms of the amount of buttons needed to play. And also you pretty much just need one joystick to play it because it's got a really good um, camera tracking. So wherever the Spyro goes and turns, the camera will follow it really well. So what we did is that we gave him access to a few switches. So he's got all the buttons he needs for the main controls of Spyro where, so he needs one for, for jumping in Spyro, he needs one to do a charged horn attack. And he needs one to breathe fire. So that's normally um, in PlayStation terms, it's normally the X button, square, and then circle. And he's got a single joystick for that. So he's able to play that really well. As for the Lego games, that's where it requires a few more buttons to play. So we ask um, his parents whether he'd be okay playing that you know, cooperatively using um, the, the co pilot concept with the, um, with the adapter. So we actually hooked up the, uh, the Titan 2. And we plug that um, with the adaptive controller and another PlayStation 4 controller. And everything was working really well. And Ethan was having a, a really good go just chasing a few enemies in, um, in Spyro. And here we have Brenda. So this is kind of going towards the other age range of people that we work with. So um, Brenda has multiple sclerosis. And this is resulting in a lot more finer movement and weaker muscles. And so she finds that accessing a standard gamepad was just a bit too um, taxing for her. She just couldn't um, reach all the buttons too much. So she really wanted to play a lot of Zelda games on Nintendo Switch because she used to play them about 30 years ago when she was a lot younger. 
And this is just an example of one of the video calls that um, that we do. I try to get a good photo of me trying to, to trying to look okay, but I couldn't. But we're just explaining about how some of our kit plugs in, how it works to Brenda. And this was the result. So she's got a large Velcro tray, just like um, Ethan did. And we've also got one of the zigzag joysticks. And so she's got enough switches to be able to play Link's Awakening. So that's one of the simpler games in the, the Zelda series because it doesn't require two joysticks again. So it's got a, what we call a top-down view. So she's able to see um, the screen from a top-down perspective. And because the camera moves when, when Link does, then uh, there's no need for a, a second joystick. However, there are a few more buttons that she has compared to Ethan, but she's able to access each of them. And so she was um, very happy that she was able to, to play Zelda once again. So just to wrap up now, this is um, our game access website, so it's gameaccess.info. And what this is, is we've put together um, a host of articles that range from equipment tutorials, from, uh, from game controls and game settings, um, and, and, and sometimes some case studies. And so we've, we've put together all these articles and provide breakdowns of controls and settings in a lot of these popular games. So you can see you've got Gran Turismo 7 there, got Marvel's Guide to the Galaxy, and you've got some other hardware stuff, like there's a, a switch interface there that plugs into a PC. And we often get some videos as well put together that, um, that we record ourselves and we do the voiceover and everything. Um, so we research the game, we take a look at the settings that we may find useful for some people, and then we disseminate that information to make sure everyone knows, you know, if they want to play a certain game, here are some settings that may be able to help you. So yeah, these are just a lot of articles on, um, that we put together and it's ever growing. So we are continually updating this. So to summarize, we know that every person's different. Every single setup is completely tailored towards the individual based on their movements and the games that they wanna play. So we know that people do change over time and that's why we need to keep on checking in and readjusting setups or taking stuff away or adding stuff to make sure that they're still able to play to um, you know, the best that they can. A lot of the equipment that we do buy is, um, is off the shelf. So it's not like completely custom made. It's, um, it's stuff that you can buy from you know, Microsoft Logitech or um, just, just general websites So we purchase everything from. And the Special Effect team is available free of charge to anybody needing help. So um, well, we do need some specialist kits such as the, um, the low force stuff that doesn't require too much movement to, to access. So that's where our technician comes in, but um, we're still trying to work with developers to try and get this, you know, ideas like this, um, you know, a bit more ingrained in future um, controllers coming out. And it's always good to just look at a few settings in a, whatever game you're playing, because there may be something in there that, that might be able to, to help the person to, to play it. Uh, alternatively, you can also just go to our website as well to see if the if we've done a, a post on the game at all and uh, yeah just see if there's anything that we could do to help but please feel free to get in touch if you feel like you can use our services and thank you for listening so um if you want to take a look at our resources take a look at um specialeffect.org.uk it's got um everything you can find on there including the um the game access website a bunch of case studies um ways that you can uh, fundraise for us there's, there's a whole wealth of information there so please um do go and check it out thank you very much thanks jacob that was really interesting thank you um really good combination of uh, physical adaptations plus the settings in the game um yeah um plus the other things you can use with it really useful um does anyone have any questions at the moment for jacob uh, while we've got him here uh, feel free to put it into the chat or um or uh, yeah feel free to turn your mic on um i'd be interested if, if anyone does have a student in particular that they're thinking of um kind of who they can help um it'd be good to hear about that um so yeah any questions at all and, uh, I'll keep 
chat and the video open a bit if we've got any questions, but I'll just share our outro slide. So um, thank you everyone for attending. Um, if you've got any feedback on this, then let us know, uh, techability at natspec.org.uk. Uh, we're also on Twitter at tech underscore ability one, and you can catch us on our website and uh, check out our last webinars as well. Uh, so we'll end it there. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, thank you, Jacob, again. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll have to stay in touch. Um, yeah, definitely. definitely. Yeah. yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Cheers, everyone.